The mighty Marvel Western event was launched in the summer of 2006, orchestrated by Marvel editor Mark Panacea, and consists of four one-shots and one handbook. There is no reading order to the books, nor are they connected in any kind of story way. They just are, and this makes it pretty easy to pick one up and just start reading it. The issues are structured similarly to the old Western anthology comics. There is one main story that occupies the most physical space, about 22 pages, which is generally the story featured on the cover of the book. There is then a smaller B story, which is about half the length of the first story, around 8 pages, and then we have some reprinted material bringing up the rear. As with the one-shots, these stories do not connect in any way. There are no through lines in this event, no background plots that are building, there are no hidden connections. It's a super weird way to do a summer event in my mind, but that's kind of what makes it interesting to me. These books are not built like a 2006 standard Marvel Comics event, with miniseries and tie-ins and spin-off supporting books promising lasting changes that only end up lasting for four months. Nah, these are just comics. The only real expectation of the audience is that you read them and enjoy them, and I mean, sure, hopefully buy more. So let's get into it. With no reading order to guide me, I'm going to be moving through these books alphabetically, which means that my name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown episode 19.11, featuring Kid Colt and the Arizona Girl. We've talked about Kid Colt quite a bit already in this string of episodes, back during Blaze of Glory and the Sensational Seven miniseries. One of those series depicted Colt as a hot-tempered, quick-shooting outlaw. The other as a man driven by his sexual needs, insatiable in his desires, but more than satisfactory to his partners. This version of Kid Colt is much more inspired by the stories of the 40s and 50s, where he is a good guy who made a mistake in his past, and he is trying to set things right. He is also back in his more classical outfit, a red shirt, blue jeans, a white and black cowhide vest, and a white cowboy hat. We have not, however, talked about the Arizona girl at all, who was also sometimes known as Arizona Annie. I thought for sure that this woman was going to be the marvelized version of Annie Oakley. Like, rather than telling stories about a real person, maybe Marvel chose to create a new fictionalized character that they could own and profit off of and do whatever they wanted with. We have seen so far that the Marvel West doesn't really have a lot of leading ladies. Out of the 20 comics that we have talked about, we have had two women in important roles, uh, Rosa in Apache Skies and Annie Oakley in Sensational Seven. So, maybe Marvel wanted to make someone new and increase their female representation. But I was quite surprised to learn that the Arizona Girl originally debuted in the spring of 1948 in the comic called The Wild West. She even appears in Lego Marvel Super Heroes 2, which is something that I did not know and my wife played the crap out of that game, so that's kind of neat. So maybe the Arizona Girl is a riff off of Annie Oakley. I don't know. Oakley was born and raised in Ohio, which is another thing that I didn't know. Why didn't anybody tell me the interesting things about Ohio when I lived there? So there's no real Arizona connection to Oakley that could have inspired this version of the character. In any case, the Arizona girl is definitely treated as a separate character in this story. So welcome to the party, A.G. Our heroes are being written by Justin Gray and Jimmy Palmiotti. They are penciled by Federica Manfredi, inked by Jimmy Palmiotti, and they are colored by Lori Cronenberg in a story called Last Stage to Oblivion. The story opens in the pouring rain. Eight hooves and four wooden wheels pound the muddy dirt as we watch a stagecoach tear through a short, rocky canyon. Sitting atop the walls are several archers, indigenous peoples, their arrows aimed at the coach. On top of the coach is a man, Kid Colt, 
as he fires at the attackers and complains about the job. Just a simple job, she said. Guard the stage till it gets to Wilcox, she said. No one said anything about bloodthirsty Apaches. Hanging out of one of the coach's windows is the Arizona girl, her own pistol spitting fire. There ain't no point in riding shotgun on a peaceful drive now, is there? The driver of the coach, clearly anxious to be clear of all this, cracks the reins harder. The struggle goes on for a few pages. We see an Apache warrior get shot down, Arizona girl berates the other passengers in the coach for not helping them, and then one of the warriors makes a final attempt to stop our heroes. He dives at the coach, and Kid Colt expertly grabs his wrist, guiding him over the side and leaving him behind. Having passed through the trouble, Colt and Annie let out a sigh of relief. The Apaches are falling back. But as they exit the canyon, they pass by several heads impaled on stakes. They're wrinkled and shriveled, one of them being picked at by a vulture. Kid Colt makes a face. What in the hell is that? Annie replies that it looks like an Apache warning sign. But it's weird that it is pointing away from the town. They should be pointed towards it, warning people not to come this way. Ah well. The coach rolls to a stop in town. Rain is still falling, but we see a number of people moving about the streets, both on horses and off. Despite this, Colt complains that he's been to friendlier Mexican prisons. What, was he expecting a parade? You're strangers riding into town, like, I would pretend that I didn't see you either, kid. Annie agrees with him, though. This place smells funny. So let's get paid, find a saloon, and get some horses so that they can head out in the morning. The sooner they're gone, the better. As Annie exits the car, Colt can't help but smile. He forgot how mighty fine she looks when she's soaking wet. <coughs> Whoa, wow. That is a joke I wasn't expecting to find in this string of comic books. All right. Annie tells him to keep it holstered. For now. They head to the nearest saloon with some guy named Pete, who pays them for the work done. He says that he wouldn't mind staying for a drink normally, but this town is giving him the jitters. He's out. I think Pete is supposed to be the driver of the stagecoach, but I'm not sure. It's not explained and it's never elaborated on. Annie and Colt then head into the saloon, and all eyes turn to them. What? Annie asks. Do they have no women in this town, or are y'all half-blind? Colt asks her to back off. They've already killed enough people today. She scoffs at this, <laughs> says you. They approach the bar, ordering whiskeys, and Annie recognizes the bartender. He used to work at a Dodge City saloon, didn't he? The bartender denies this. You must have him confused with someone else. Annie is sure that she has seen him before, but Colt tells her to keep quiet. He recognizes most of the faces in this room, and they're outlaws. One of them might even be Bill Hickok. The bartender probably doesn't want to get noticed any more than they do. Remember? Kid Colt is an outlaw. Which is his own fault, Annie replies. He killed those men in self-defense. He could clear his name at any time instead of staying one step ahead of the law for the rest of his life. What's the harm? Colt asks. It's a big country. They'll get sick of looking for me eventually. The pair order some more drinks and start chatting with the bartender. This is a weird town you got here. We tend to keep to ourselves, he replies. You heading on soon? They need a bath and some horses first, Colt answers. There's a hotel across the street. That'll get them their baths, the bartender says. But horses are hard to come by. The Apache keep most traders away. The best way to get a horse, unfortunately, is if somebody dies. Well, does anybody with a horse need killing, then? Annie asks. Colt quickly adds that what she means, is there anyone with a bounty on them in town? The bartender glares at them for a second. You don't want to talk like that, mister. We got all kinds of unsavory folk here. Annie smiles. Well, you can count them among that number. She thanks him for his time, and they leave the saloon. The rain has stopped as they enter the street, but Annie points out something strange to her. There are no kids running around. There are lots of people, but there are no kids. Colt figures that the rain must have kept them inside, and anyways, they have better things to do 
Like getting her in a soapy tub so that he can wash her down? Well, maybe Zimmerman's take on the character wasn't that far off, actually, huh? Annie and Colt flirt for a bit as they cross the street, but before they can head into the hotel, a posse of men rides up to them on horseback. One of them is holding up a piece of paper, and he shouts, That's them! It's their lucky day! The men draw their guns, and Colt shouts for Annie to go left and to mind the horses. They both take off, drawing their own guns, and Annie complains, Of course she'll mind the horses! She isn't stupid! That's not what Colt meant, he says, but she cuts him off mid-argument. Whether he meant it or not, the implication was clear. The pair do a fine job of shooting their attackers. Annie ends the fight by killing the man who was about to horse stomp on Kid Colt. They tie up a couple of the horses outside of the hotel, claiming them for their own, and then they head in, ordering a room for the night. After relaxing... For a time in their room, Kid Colt and Arizona Girl go for a nice stroll back to the saloon from earlier. They pass by four bodies in pine boxes, their faces covered by their hats. They're the four men that they just killed earlier. Colt is unsettled by this. It's not like they need any more attention. But in the saloon they go, and they're surprised to see the patrons inside. Kid Colt immediately recognizes Jesse James and the Rawhide Kid. In fact, he walks up to Rawhide, hands stuck out for a handshake. Man, I never expected to see you here. Rawhide doesn't shake his hand, though. In fact, he glares at Colt. You must have me mixed up with someone else. And Kid Colt remains firm on this. Hell no, I don't. We rode together against the Chambers Gang in El Paso. I'd recognize you anywhere. Look. Rawhide says, I don't know you. Now skedaddle before I get angry. Colt figures that Rawhide must be drunk. They've known each other for many years now. Come on, man, he's Kid Colt, remember? Rawhide goes for his guns. I tried to warn you. And then suddenly he shot. The Rawhide kid's body falls to the floor. The Arizona girl spins her pistol, pleased with her shooting. Kid Colt isn't thrilled, though. Damn it, Annie, he was my friend! Well, he wasn't acting all that friendly to me. Uh, so, so you shoot him? Obviously, both of our leads have to set their eyes on Rawhide's body, Annie in self-satisfaction, and Kid Colt in horror. So they are both watching when the body suddenly changes shape. The skin turns green, the ears become pointed, and the chin splits into vertical ridges. Kid Colt and Annie have no context for this, but she just killed an alien scroll. The rest of the bar patrons suddenly drop their own disguises as well. They've been discovered! Kill them all! Annie and Colt run into the street, dodging lead, as one of the scrolls shouts that soon this whole planet will belong to the Scroll Empire. Colt is the only one who picks up on that threat, though. Claiming planet? Annie, you think these fellas are from, you know... Up there? Annie doesn't care if they're from up there or the pits below. Fill these geckos with lead before they do the same to us. But our heroes are still outnumbered and outgunned. They need something to even the odds. Kid Colt runs to their new horses and grabs a stick of dynamite from one of the saddle pouches. He hurls it at the saloon and shouts for Annie to shoot the fuse. She does, lighting the stick just before it breaks through the window. Prepare yourself for the smell of roasted lizard, she says. The entire building explodes. Annie and Colt fire on the few remaining scrolls who emerge from the flames, scrabbling to climb onto their horses. As they head for the outskirts of town, one lone scroll still stands before them. In its own language, the scroll implores Slugurt, their god of war, to bless it with its aid. Its form shifts and suddenly a massive brown bear towers over our heroes. The pair fight over whose fault all of this is, Colt blaming Annie for killing Rawhide, and Annie incredulous that she's being blamed at all because she saved his life. She then suggests that he use some more of that dynamite to kill this bear, and he does, lighting another stick before throwing it into the bear's mouth. Choking on the stick, the scroll does not have time to shift back into a form that has hands, and it explodes. Spattering our leads, 
with scroll guts. Are they finished yet? Annie asks. Kid Colt looks over the town. Well, everything has been blown up, burned down, or broken. So yes, their work here is done. Or maybe not. A group of Apache warriors rides up to them, serious and somber. How many bullets does Colt have left? Annie asks. One of the Apaches approaches them, stating that they killed many of his warriors. They try to make excuses for this, but he cuts them off. He is talking now. His people call this the Black Place. They saw the Greenskins change their form and feared them. They could tell that they were not of the earth and sky. But they, a skinny white man and a girl, have made this place clean again. Annie bristles at that comment. Don't you call her a girl. Colt touches her arm. Not now, Annie. The chief goes on. For this great deed, he will not kill them and use their guts to string their bows. Her temper up by his earlier comment, Annie tells him to try it. The chief continues to ignore her. He holds out a stick with some decorations and a feather tied to it. So long as they carry this, they can travel safely through the Apache's lands. The chief holds it out to Kid Colt, but Annie is the one who snatches it. I'll take that. The chief, wide-eyed, looks at Colt. You should discipline your woman. And now she's pissed. Why, you, I oughta. Kid Colt grabs her arm and gently leads her away as she shouts back at the chief. I won't let any man disrespect my womanhood. Red, black, white, yellow, or green. Colt just quietly puts his hat back on. Annie, you're gonna get us a back full of arrows, he says. The chief watches them leave. That woman is crazy. As they ride off, Colt suggests that maybe Annie relax the next time that they're in a town. And shaking her fist at him, Annie exclaims, That she is calm! And our first story ends. This was super fun uh, and a cute story. I totally dug this. One of the complaints that I have overall about Marvel's Westerns to this point is that they don't feel very Marvel. Outside of the time travel aspect of Two Gun and the Sunset Riders, which was very downplayed, and Vegas's sci-fi elements in his story in Amazing Fantasy, most of what we have been exploring so far in these books could have been any Western story. Nothing about these really feels like the sci-fi slash fantasy makeup that is the Marvel Universe. But this story featuring Scrolls as the bad guy is really nice, and the Scrolls are a specifically Marvel bad guy. And I totally didn't see this particular twist coming in the story. Like, what a great way to play with what presents as a standard issue Western story. Authors Gray and Paul Miotti even work in little clues for build-up. The warning sign heads that we see when Colt and Annie are driving into town, the ones that are put on pikes, one of them, upon closer inspection, kind of looks like a scroll head. I just couldn't tell that thanks to what I thought was its sun-baked wrinkles and complexion. Then we have Annie recognizing the bartender, who is a scroll copying that bartender's looks. And Colt says that half the patrons of the saloon are wanted men. These scrolls are choosing their human shapes based off of wanted posters. And then we see this idea referenced when Annie and Colt are attacked after leaving the saloon. Those riders that rode into town and attacked them had a wanted poster in hand. They weren't looking for bounties, they were looking for a new form to take. They were just lucky enough to encounter a pair that they could not only copy, but then kill which would keep situations like this very story from happening again, thus making it harder to out them as shape-shifting scrolls. I am surprised that the scrolls that they shot initially actually died from their gunshot wounds. Not because scrolls are inherently really tough, but they do have alien physiologies, so it's not like a scroll's heart is in the same place that a human's heart is. And while Kid Colt and Annie are expert shots, they would be aiming for human organs, and a clever scroll would just shift things around to prevent those important organs from being shot. I would also expect a scroll to be able to seal the bullet wound after being shot, but I guess, I mean, maybe not. Scrolls are not impervious to harm, after all, they can just change their shape. 
I'm trying to remember if other scroll-based stories had scrolls being shot and whether or not they were able to survive the wounds. But honestly, I seem to recall scrolls dying pretty easily. I mean, as long as they weren't a super scroll who does have additional superpowers, they're just kind of people who can shapeshift. I honestly thought that the dudes who attacked Kid Colt and Annie were, like, play-acting that attack initially. Like, the bartender scroll learned that the two wouldn't be leaving town until they got horses. So then, off-panel, he arranged for some bounty hunters to show up with horses, get shot, and die, but they would just fake die, and then Colt and Annie would take their horses and get the floop out of town, keeping the scrolls from being exposed. The dead men would then just come back to life after they left. Or, maybe in the story that we did get, maybe they could have popped up when things were going south for the scrolls and then join in the shootout. But that didn't happen either, because I guess hot lead's enough to kill a scroll. The thing that I enjoy the most here is probably the relationship between Kid Colt and Annie. Gray and Palmiotti make Annie the hothead of this pair. She's the action-hungry, quick-tempered, shoot-first-and-ask-questions-later half of them. This is a super fun dynamic, as the American West was generally not thought of as a place for a woman. And yet, here's Annie, making her own way through sheer force of will and an open eagerness to shoot people. No one here expects her to be a force, save for Kid Colt, and that's just fun to watch. In contrast, Colt is the one who is the thinker. He is the one who figures out that the saloon patrons might not want to be recognized for any number of reasons, so maybe you should stop asking any. I like the two bickering during their gunfights as well. That's a fun background element to all of the action scenes, which I tried to work into the breakdown, but I didn't put every single argument in there. I didn't want to just transpose the entire script of this comic into the episode. These two are clearly comfortable with each other, each one trusting the other implicitly, but they are also willing to poke fun at each other, and generally they give each other the business. Before they go to their hotel room, for example, Kid Colt jokes that Annie must be a man-hater, and she smiles, replying yes, except for one man, and obviously that man is him. I don't know how big of a horn dog Kid Colt was back in his original appearances, but both Zimmerman and now Gray and Palmiotti specifically have him be really flirty or horny. In the Sensational 7, Colt was trying to get into Annie Oakley's cowhide skirt the entire time, and he was depicted as much more open in his female interests. But in this story, Kid Colt feels very much devoted to the Arizona girl. It feels like they are in a committed relationship, but one in which Annie isn't willing to settle down yet. But it still works, and they feel really fun together. I have two main plot complaints, so let's just get these done. First off, by the end of the story, Kid Colt and Annie have pretty much destroyed the town of Wilcox, but at the beginning of this story, they escorted, like, four people to town inside that stagecoach. So, were those people scrolls? Or were they normal humans? And if so, were they killed in this scuffle? And if the whole town was populated by nothing but scrolls, then why did those people want to come here? This isn't a big thing in the story, and honestly, while I did think of it at the very beginning of the story... I had completely forgotten this concern by the end, because it just kind of sucked me in. But looking back now at it with a critical eye, I'm, I'm left wondering what exactly is going on here. Secondly, the Apache story elements remain odd. I like the bit about them discovering the scrolls first, and even putting up their warning signs facing away from the town, basically telling anybody approaching to beware death lies ahead. But if they're aware of what's going on in the town... Why not block the route better? We're told that the Apaches are keeping traders away by the scroll bartender, so clearly they are trying to isolate the town, which also implies that this has been going on for some time. So why not build some kind of blockage or collapse one of those canyon walls? I'll buy that maybe the chief could speak some English but not write it, and so there's no warning signs, but this still feels like a very half-done way of blocking the town. And, of course, we have the sexist behavior towards Annie that I don't really appreciate. 
This is clearly done for laughs, as the whole story has a very light-hearted feel to it, and Annie's reactions in this scene are played very over the top by the artwork, but it does feel frustrating to see Annie mocked for her sex after being so competent and skilled through the entire story. The artwork by Manfredi, Palmiotti, and Cronenberg is super solid in this. The three present a fairly realistic art style, although the comedic elements towards the end are pretty played up. The, the artwork does gain a nice animated feel during those moments. It all works, don't get me wrong, you just wouldn't expect that particular kind of look by the beginning of this book. We go from very serious to very comedic by the end. Once you add in the weirdness of the scrolls, you kind of lose the more serious nature of the story. Manfredi actually drew material for three issues of Amazing Fantasy, so clearly somebody on that book liked what she did and hired her to work on this book, so that's pretty cool to see. Gray and Palmiotti, on the other hand, are no newcomers to writing or drawing westerns. Together, they wrote DC's western character, Jonah Hex, for 70 issues between 2005 and 2011, and for another 34 issues in the new 52 title, All-Star Western. They have also done a number of books for other publishers. I'm talking Marvel, DC, Wildstorm, Image, Dynamite Entertainment, Dark Horse. This is a team that knows what they are doing and knows how to work it in a fast-paced story with fun, engaging dialogue and a cool setup. I totally enjoyed this story, but this isn't the only one we got in this one shot. Our second story is called The Philadelphia Philly, and it was written by Jim McCann, drawn by David Williams, and it was colored by Rico Renzi. It opens on a train, its destination unimportant. The story is narrated by a man with red hair, who we will learn is called Spender. He has won his way into a high-stakes card game. There are three kinds of people who make it into this kind of game, he says. The really good, the really rich and the really stupid. Normally, he is the stupid one, but tonight, well, he is aiming to be the rich one. We get a look at his sleeve resting on the table, and he finishes his thought, even if he has to cheat, and we can see an ace up his sleeve. Sounds to me like he's one of the stupid ones, then. The player that he's up against is a tough-looking Subanovich. He's thick, with a short square nose, a perpetual scowl, and a black and white beard that actually looks really good on him. A pile of chips rest in the center of the table that they sit at, along with a six-shooter. This gentleman, who I'm going to call Black Jack Shellac in honor of Looney Tunes, declares that he will raise the bet and puts down the deed to his ranch. There are 50 head of cattle, a dozen steeds, and three ranch hands to go with it. Reckon that'll cover the bet? Spender smiles at the deed. Well, you know, he's never been much of one for cattle, but he does love horses. Before he can play his own hand, though, a woman walks into the train car. A woman that he recognizes, if only in concept. She wears a bright red dress with perfectly done brown hair. Our narrator tells us that there's only one woman in these parts who ain't selling her body or slinging beers. Only one woman who can walk into a car filled with cigarette smoke and men and cards and not gag at the smell. And that's the Philadelphia Philly. She walks past their table and sits down, lifting a teacup to her lips. Spender has heard of what she can do to a man if he's caught breaking the law but he's never heard what she could do to a man just by looking at him. His daydream is interrupted by Jack looking at the card table. Are you going to play or ask the lady how she takes her tea? Spender has to work to put his focus back on the game, uh, uh, chuckling <laughs> before asking where were we. Jack says that you're about to lose the biggest game of your life. And Spender thinks that's a bit funny. You were the one who raised me, if I remember correctly. And he doesn't see how a man could stand to lose any more. Why, the only thing that Jack has left to him is his name, right? So Spender raises the bet, intending to call this man out, but a slender hand is suddenly resting on the chips. The filly apologizes for interrupting the game, but she cannot let this continue. 
If she understands this game correctly, the point is to have better cards in hand than the opponent, yes? Spender says that yes, it is, ma'am. And the bets are then made on the assumption that you have the better hand, correct? This time, Jack is the one who answers, yeah, it is. And just to be sure, there is no way to know what the other player has in their hand, she asks. No, there ain't, Jack answers, while quietly cocking the gun, resting in his holster at his side. Well then, this game can simply not go on. One of them has an unfair advantage. You see, and here she grabs Spender's arm and lifts it into the air, exposing the ace up his sleeve. We have a cheat. Everyone jumps to their feet, and Jack draws his gun. What kind of setup is this? The filly spreads her arms and blocks Spender off from Jack. Now, sir, this can all be, she whispers to Spender, run, handled in a run, most civilized manner. Spender just blinks. Huh? So now she pushes him, shouting, run! She then kicks over the table into Jack's way. The hand is a draw. Here is your money, sir. Thank you very much. She then takes off after Spender. They pause for a moment between train cars as Spender is more than a little upset at this interruption. What are you doing? He shouts. She calmly replies that although it might appear otherwise, she is trying to save his life. From who? He asks. Blackjack slams into the door, panting at the glass. Why, from him, actually, the filly replies. Now run. As the pair take off, their pursuer not far behind, we learn that the filly overheard that man and his accomplice plot to let Spender win the game. They could tell that he was cheating. Apparently, he isn't very good at cards. After which, they said that they would then follow him to his hotel in whatever town he got off at and kill him and take their money back. Spender explains that he was hoping to use that game to win himself a new name. He lost his in a card game, and now all he's left with is Spender. And even after all of this, he has a hard time believing the filly, until bullets embed themselves into the wall around him. She is deadly serious about Jack being serious. They exit the train through a rooftop hatch. Spender asks her why she couldn't just say something back in town when she first heard all of this. And the filly is taken aback. Well, he was cheating. That was rude. Spender can't help but laugh at this. While he does, the filly spots their way off of this train, and she gives him a quick warning and a shove. She then jumps off herself, landing him on an arm used to catch mailbags and herself in a pile of hay. Well, she's cost him a fortune, a ranch, and a new name. Any bright ideas, Spender asks. Winning is the hard part, she quotes, so he's just going to have to try harder to win next time. Inwardly, Spender sighs. Nothing good can come from a lady walking into a card game. If you couldn't tell, this story is much shorter than our lead feature. The story with Kid Colt and the Arizona Girl was a full 22-page story, uninterrupted by ads, by the way. That's something that I didn't notice when I was reading, uh, but upon the f doing the breakdown, I saw that, and that's a very nice feature. This story with the filly is just a scant eight pages, and I feel like author Jim McCann does a really good job demonstrating the concept here. We don't get a lot of details to anybody. This actually reads more like a pitch for a comic to me than a fully realized comic, but the dynamic here is pretty fun. Our title character, the filly, feels intelligent and maybe a bit uptight, like she feels like she comes from proper society, capital P, capital S on those words, thank you. She waltzes into that card game with the utmost confidence and surety. I super enjoy how she manipulates Spender and his opponent, too. Like, let me tangent into those two for a minute, and we'll circle back around to how that plays on the filly's abilities. McCann and Williams spend quite a few panels on close-up shots of Spender and Jack at the beginning of the comic. They're really dialed in on their acting. Spender is someone who has pretty animated facial expressions, while Jack is stone-faced. His jaw is set, his brows are scowled, and he is focused, 
on watching Spender's every move. He feels like a predator watching his prey, which makes sense as he is planning to lose this game to Spender and then hunt him down and kill him. Spender is literally his prey. But then, the filly walks into this contest and totally disarms him with a few innocent questions. She absolutely understands how to play poker, but she asks these two questions in order to appeal to their sense of knowledge and importance, and so they don't suspect that she is up to anything. So, she is someone who isn't just educated based on her use of language and her manners, she is also someone who is experienced based on her casual knowledge of how to play poker and how to spot a cheater, and she also knows how to manipulate other people. The filly is all smarts. She knows how to play Jack and Spender like an expert in this scene. Despite this knowledge base, though, there is one thing odd about the filly, and that's her motivation. The filly tells us and Spender that she overheard Jack and his accomplices' plan back in town before any of them even got on this train. She then got on this train knowing that Jack planned to lose to Spender and then kill him, and okay, so she knows that this is happening. But when Spender asks why she didn't say something sooner, she says that he was cheating and that's not fair. So, what? She wanted to make sure that Spender was punished or exposed for his uncivilized crime in a public and potentially life-threatening way? I'm just not sure what her goal here was. Spender, for the most part, feels like your classic down-on-his-luck card player. He has clearly lost a lot over time. He claims to not even have his own name at this point. In fact, his main goal with this card game was to win Jack's name. That's why he keeps raising the stakes of the game. He doesn't actually want the ranch or the cattle or the horses. What he wants is a name. And why is the big question? Names often have power in stories. In a lot of European myths or fairy tales, not giving away your real name or true name is a core concept. Knowing something's true name gives you power over them, or them power over you. This was also a feature of Studio Ghibli's Spirited Away, which saw lead character Chihiro sign away her name as part of her contract, and then she started to forget why she was there in the first place. This idea doesn't show up in Western storytelling all that much, or at the very least in American storytelling, I suppose. A part of the great American myth is the ability to remake oneself, to be reborn and find success or escape a troubled path. So Spender losing his name and it being a bad thing for him implies that he must have had a pretty comfortable life attached to that name. Maybe he had access to money or a business or a lover. And now that he doesn't have the name, he doesn't have those things. How did he lose his name? Does he have any hope of getting his original name back? And who has it now? These are all fascinating questions that I would love to have answers for, but we'll never get them. This is the only appearance of these two characters in all of the Marvel Universe. I like McCann's writing here. Jim McCann has done a bunch of stories for Marvel, uh, especially in the early 2000s, most famously, I think, reuniting Hawkeye with his believed dead wife, Mockingbird. You can actually see echoes of those two characters here, with the action-y male lead character and the more intelligent, competent female lead character. The Philadelphia Philly echoes what Mockingbird will become, and Spender kind of has some echoes of Hawkeye's down-on-his-luckness. I really like David Williams's artwork in this story. It isn't anything eye-catching, which I feel really bad saying, but it is solid artwork. It reminds me of early Stuart Immerman, actually, in its uh, lines and facial expressions. Solid comic book storytelling is not the same thing as eye-catching artwork, I, I just gotta say. Eye-catching artwork is always going to stand out, even if it isn't very good artwork. Good artwork is always good artwork, though, even if it doesn't stand out. And Williams' artwork is not standing out here, but it is good. And Comic Vine has a pretty large body of work listed for Williams, so other people clearly recognized his skill, too. 
The issue then continues with three reprints of older Western comics. This is an interesting addition to me, as it really harkens back to the older 40s era comic book releases. Remember our first episode in this streak? A lot of these Western characters lived on in reprint comics. Comics in the 1940s were a much more expendable medium. Kids were supposed to buy them, read them, and throw them away like a newspaper. So releasing those older materials again and again and again was a good way to save costs, as the publisher didn't need to pay a creative team for new material every month, and it was also a good way to keep those characters as a constant in the audience's minds. Two years ago, you may have gone to the newsstand and bought a story featuring the Rawhide Kid, and now, two years later, you might read that very same story and go, Oh my god, I found it again! That's great! These stories are all very short, six pages, five pages, and five pages respectively. Two of them star the classic Rawhide Kid, and the middle story features someone I had never heard of before, a railroad detective named Silent Jefferson. The first story, titled Stagecoach to Shotgun Gap, was written by Stan Lee, drawn by Jack Kirby, inked by Dick Ayers, with new colors on it by Michael Kelleher. Rawhide races after a stagecoach in the opening, and the drivers just see a gunman who is trying to ride them down, and you do not mess with that kind of thing. So they open fire back and ride harder. But come on, this is the Rawhide Kid. He catches up with ease, and using his tremendous shooting skills, he shoots the gun out of the co-pilot's hand. He ain't harmed, but he is disarmed. So Rawhide manages to stop the coach and explain that he isn't an outlaw, y'all. He just wanted a ride. Wah, wah, wah. So they let Rawhide into the coach, and I don't know what becomes of the horse he rolled all the way here, which kind of breaks my heart. Inside, Rawhide meets an old woman who immediately tells him that she has all of her worldly possessions inside of her bag, so he better not floop with her. And Rawhide is just kind of not interested. Of course, he just wants to be left alone. There is also a father and son pair. The son has some kind of leg injury, and he is excited to be riding with THE Rawhide Kid. He is so excited that he tells Rawhide that they are headed to St. Louis to see a doctor who can hopefully fix his leg. They have a lot of money on them too, but the kid announces that he's not going to let them get robbed. You know, it's stories like these that make me question Stanley's writing abilities. Anyways, there is a tree in the path, and as the coach rolls to a stop, a handful of gunmen jump out and ambush them. They rob the other passengers until they get to Rawhide, who defeats the men with fists and guns. At one point, he literally shoots the masks off of the outlaws' faces, exposing them. With the property returned, the stagecoach starts rolling, and the story ends. So obviously, this story isn't really anything of note. For me, it is a real treat to look at Jack Kirby's artwork on the page. I'm not sure if it's because this is a western, or if it's Ayers inking toning it down, but Kirby has a fairly realistic sense of design to this story. I'm actually amazed at how cool Rawhide comes off in this. He's calm, he's relaxed, but he is also fast and sure of himself. You can really see the beginning of superheroes here, with Rawhide shooting the masks off of the bandits. I mean, I think that's a pretty impossible shot. But it is something that Hawkeye, or the Green Arrow, will go on to do eventually with no trouble at all. God, those passengers are dumb. Like, grade A dumb. I don't... Huh. <sighs> the second story, The Man Who Robbed the Express, was also written by Lee, but was drawn and inked by Dick Ayers himself, with color reconstruction by Michael Kelleher. In this one, we are first introduced to Brett Brown who actually lists his occupation as a train robber in his narration. He is fresh out of jail and eager to get back on that horse. You know, it's not how many times you get arrested, it's how many times you get free that really matters. Brown boards a train, and he starts to size things up. He asks around a little bit and learns that there is a detective on this train as a deterrent to train robbers. He spots a man that he suspects is the detective, so haha, <laughs> check. And then he spots a rather, I don't know, schlubby, 
unimpressive looking man. Brown recognizes a train bum when he sees one, and that is just who he's looking for. Brown sits down next to the bum and introduces himself. The bum recognizes the name, and Brown then makes his pitch. He's gonna rob this train, but he needs someone to keep an eye on the detective. If this guy is willing to play along, he will split the loot with him. The bum agrees, sits down next to the detective, and threatens him with a gun in his pocket. Brown, meanwhile, heads to the mail car. He thinks to himself that this is perfect. He'll get all the loot and leave this bum holding all the blame. Looks like everything's coming up Brett Brown, baby. So Brown gets to the mail car, he decks the guard, shoots the lock, and then gets his hands on the gold. Satisfied, he returns to the bum, eager to get moving before someone sounds an alarm. You did it? The bum asks. Then he points his gun at Brown. Well, that's perfect. He's been waiting to meet Brown for a long time. And at first, Brown is confused by this turn of events, asking this dude who he thinks he is. And the bum is actually Silent Jefferson, the railroad detective. Brown looks at the other guy, the one that he thought was a detective. Well, then who are you? Incredulously, the man says that he's on vacation from New York. He thought that this trip would be good for his nerves. And Brett Brown was sent off to prison one more time, and no one ever heard of him again. Yeah, that's an abrupt ending, right? But it's only five pages, so what do you expect? The third tale, called Those Who Live by the Gun doesn't actually come with a credits page. The title page does have Stan Lee's name on it, implying that he at least scripted it, and I would guess that this is Jack Kirby artwork. It certainly has some of the most Kirby-esque faces that I have seen in these pages so far. This time, the story opens at night, with the rawhide kid sleeping out under a tree. Three outlaws have surrounded him. They have one end of a noose ready to go but they loop it around one of his feet and not his neck. The rest of the rope is looped over the tree, and when ready, one of the men pulls the rope taut real quick. Yanked upside down, this wakes Rawhide up, who is now confused and angry. These men know who Rawhide is, and they are eager to collect the bounty on him. Their leader orders another gent named Blackie to cut him down, and when he grabs Rawhide by the collar, the cowboy rolls with the motion, throwing Blackie over his body. One of the men tries to charge Rawhide and ends up slamming into the tree because Rawhide dodges. Another then tries to get him with a lasso, but Rawhide catches it and uses it as a whip to throw the other two guys around. By this time, the leader has made it back up to his feet and drawn his pistol. He's done playing around. That's what Rawhide was hoping for. He dashes in, kicks the gun up into the air, catches the gun, and then sharpshoots the attacker's gun belt off. Everyone then dogpiles onto Rawhide, trying to take him down with sheer numbers, but <laughs> this is the Rawhide kid. He quickly handles the goons and then ties them to the tree that he was sleeping under. Later on, a couple of rangers wander by and find our hapless villains, they recognize them all as outlaws, but how did they find themselves tied to a tree? Yeah, the second one asks, was it the rawhide kid? We've heard tell that he was in these parts. Are you loco? The tied up man asks, clearly insulted. You think one man could take us all down? We were jumped by like a, a, gr a whole group. Yeah, jumped from behind. Must have been at least a dozen of them too. All right, well, fair enough, the rangers say. No sense in blaming everything on the rawhide kid. Eh, he probably wasn't even near here. In the final panel, we see Rawhide telling his horse, Nightwind, to make haste before the law finds those jaspers and comes after them. But, thanks to his own actions, Rawhide is now safe from pursuit. I have super mixed feelings about these three short stories. Because here's the thing. These lack almost any depth or characterization to them at all. While the Rawhide Kid does face adversity, he doesn't do anything notable to defeat his enemies, nothing clever or special, like, nothing here screams this story could only be about the Rawhide Kid. And in facing those adversities, 
Rawhide is as good of a shot as he needs to be, and he is as strong of a man as he needs to be, as, like, literally he swings two fully grown men around with that lasso in the third story. Nor does Rawhide come out of these stories changed at all. He didn't grow in any kind of way. But, I mean, to be fair, the same thing could largely be said about Zimmerman's Rawhide in his two miniseries. Most of what was enjoyable about Zimmerman's stories was the way that he told them. Otherwise, Zimmerman's basic story ideas echo Stan Lee's very well. Rawhide is the best shot in the West, and he's strong as an ox, and nothing can stop him, and evil better beware, and all that jazz. The arrogance that Zimmerman's version had kind of feels justified when reading this version. Rawhide wins because... I mean, well, because he's the Rawhide kid. In anime terms, Rawhide has plot armor. He wins because the story demands that he wins because he's the lead character, and so nothing can stop him. But these stories are simple, they are to the point, they're fast-paced, and honestly, they work. As filler material between longer, more impactful stories, I can see these working pretty well. I almost wish that these were scattered throughout the comic, like open with a reprint, and then do Kid Colt and the Arizona Girl, and then do a reprint, and then the Philadelphia Philly, and then end on a reprint. That way you kind of have like a nice trail mix of everything. But I suspect that the editor wanted the first story of the comic to be the cover story, and to not alienate their reader base. If I was in a comic store and I picked this book up out of curiosity, and then I opened the cover and the first page is a reprint of an old Stan and Jack story, I'm not gonna lie, I probably wouldn't have bought it. I can understand the logic of putting all of the new material in the front of the book, with its modern production values and modern art styles and modern storytelling techniques, and then present the reprints in a fairly easy-to-ignore back section of the comic. As someone who finds this string of stories rather lackluster, personally, I kind of appreciate it. You can pick this book up, read The Kid Colt and Arizona Girl and The Philadelphia Philly Stories, and then put it back down if you want. And you don't even have to read the reprints if you don't want to. That said, there is something to be said for getting to see Jack Kirby's non-sci-fi artwork. Kirby hadn't quite reached the point where he was breaking panel borders and doing two-page spreads with these comics, so our pages are all pretty much rectangles and squares, but it still works and flows well. It looks, you know, like a western. Like he captures the time period well. I haven't seen what the original artwork would look like with its original coloring, so I don't know if Michael Kelleher's reconstruction is an improvement or not, over that original coloring, but I personally think that he does a great job overall here. These pages look good. The second story with Brett Brown stands out to me a bit more because at least it has some thought put into it. It is not a straight good guy encounters bad guys, bad guys are beaten kind of story. Focusing on Brett Brown was a fun change of pace for me, so nice job, editor, sandwiching this particular story with the other two more heroic tales. I mean, I did call every step of this story, so it's pretty obvious in its presentation, but it is also five pages, so how much story complexity do you expect? It is fun, at least, and Dick Ayers' artwork looks good in it. It's also a bit fun to contrast Silent Jefferson, the railroad detective, with the Rawhide Kid in those stories. Rawhide is someone who is fit, handsome, well-dressed, with a perfectly curled lock of hair at the front of his head. Like, he looks as great here as everyone said he looked in Zimmerman's books. But Silent Jefferson has thin, straw-like hair, droopy eyes, a five o'clock shadow, shabby clothes. Like, he looks like a bum, for sure, and he doesn't pull off a disguise at the end of the story and suddenly become this handsome, chiseled man. He's just as plain at the ending as he is at the opening, and I kind of love that. Again, sandwiched between the two Rawhide stories where Rawhide is perfect, it's a nice change of pace. These stories are a fun look back at what comic books used to be, but god am I glad that I did not pay money for these stories separately. 
I have purchased a digital copy of the Rawhide Kid Masterworks book, which collects nine issues of Stan and Jack's Rawhide series. I haven't read it at all yet, as there's only so much time in the day, but uh, that is going to be an interesting reading experience when I do get to it. All right. That was, uh, that was a lot of comic. <sighs> I thought that these one-shots might end up becoming standalone episodes just due to the sheer amount of stuff that is in them, and that sure looks like it's going to stay true. So, next time, the Black Rider visits New York City and uncovers a dark secret from his own past. The Gunhawk faces down the Midnight Gun, and in two more reprints, the Rawhide Kid must hunt down the Bat and face the Bulletproof Man. Join me in a week for Comic Book Breakdown, episode 19.12, Strange Western. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>